everyone, and welcome to Kid Like Chronicles. Um, I'm Chelsea. I'm Nikki. I'm Hannah. And today we have a very special guest, our first author guest, Stephanie Cook. Yay! Hello! Hi! Thank you for having me! Yeah, so we are really excited to have you on the podcast. Um, so just like a little bit about Stephanie. So she is a graphic novel writer, and we are coming on the podcast today to talk about her debut graphic novel published last year, Oh My God, um, and then the sequel just came out. Yeah, Oh My God's 2. That's now out in the world. It's very exciting. Um, so those ones were co-written uh, with Insha Fitzpatrick, and then I have a, another series, which we're not talking about, called Paranorthern and the Chaos Bunny a hopcalypse which uh <laughs> was my solo writing debut but what are, i'm just already derailing things <laughs> but, oh my god yes 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 yeah so just to give our listeners a little summary of what the first book is about because that's what we're going to be talking about today um so it's about a middle schooler named karen who you know is like a normal kid um she moves to mount olympus and discovers that Greek mythology and all of these, you know, legends that she's been hearing about are actually real. And so, you know, she makes friends with all these gods and mythical mythical characters at this school. And then she and her new friends have um, their tasked with a mission of solving a mystery when people start turning to stone. First question: um, I think this is this is our first graphic no- graphic novel we've had on the podcast, right, guys? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. A lot of first today. <laughs> um, I'm all about that. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, scrolled through your website and saw all the things that you worked on, and you. So you've worked on graphic novels, and you've also been in a lot of comic book like anthologies over the years. Um, like, what drew you to storytelling through comics as opposed to you know just writing like novels or short stories? Yeah. Ah. Uh... I really like the medium, you know, like I love pop culture. I love kind of all kinds of different media, TV, movies, video games. And I love to read. I've been a reader for as long as I can remember, for as long as I could read. And even then my parents were reading to me, you know, like, and there's something to me about how unique comics are in that you're marrying the visuals with the storytelling to tell a story that is so appealing. It's like being able to do a movie or TV uh, show, but without having to have millions of dollars in a budget to make it happen. And I mean, comics still cost a lot of money. They take a lot of time to make. So I'm not saying, you know, this is like real easy comparatively, (laughs) but I love working with an artist who you hand in a script and they look at like the character descriptions, maybe, you know, some Pinterest boards you've put together. And I love that moment where they hand something back to you and they are visualizing what you have put down on paper. You know, I think there's like, obviously with certain books, there's huge fandoms around that. And based on the descriptions, you see tons of fan art coming out and people interpreting those characters in their own ways. And that's kind of like what the process of creating a graphic novel is a bit like, you know, like you're having someone who's like an incredible artist interpret what you've kind of built and then they add on to that. And to me, that's like magical, like that is genuinely magical. So I love the process of collaboration and building on something with someone. And that is like what kind of drew me to comics and um, continues to keep me enthralled about comics. Okay. Yeah. So you kind of just touched on our next question a little bit, Um, (laughs) but yeah. So there were some other people involved with, oh my gods, besides just Stephanie. So um, you had your co-writer Insha Fitzpatrick and also the artist Mm. Julian Amun. Um, so we kind of just wanted to know what it was like working with a team to create a cohesive story and like how you were able to kind of combine people's different visions. Yeah. Uh, again, it can be hard sometimes like to, you get like, Incha and I knew each other before we started working together. We were friends and we'd collaborated on, uh, like we worked on like an entertainment website together. And so we had this idea for Oh My Gods and 
you hype each other up. You're like, oh, this is great. And you kind of like build on it. And you're like, but what about this? But what about this? <laughs> and that kind of initial, you know, kickoff to the idea is so much fun. It's just like having a brain baby and you're just like, how else can I make this like cool and exciting and fun? And that's just like so invigorating. You're hyping each other up. You do occasionally have to like make some like hard choices where you're both bringing each other down a bit. Cause like, it's like, oh, wait, I do like that. But like, how does it fit in? And you have to kind of like kill your darlings, you know, like kind of be like, okay, this is fun, but how does it work with the story? So, you know, there's like these moments where you're just like, yeah, like all caps lock messaging each other, just being like, we're hyped. But then it's just like, you know, you have to really kind of rein it in. But collaborating again with Insha was a lot of fun. And we're both really excitable people. We really love Greek mythology and we have different ways that we approach storytelling. You know, like I really do love character driven stories, but I think about characters and building them in different ways. Like I kind of add to characters as the story like progresses and it's like they kind of evolve and change and grow and inches very much like I have made Spotify playlists for literally every character everybody not only has a look board like a mood board for themselves but they have an aesthetic mood board and you know like she really gives dimension to the characters in a way that like I tend to kind of just I do but in a different lesser kind of way you know like I don't tend to kind of be like what would they listen to what would but it's just really fun because she's immersive and she makes you really get into the heads of your characters so you know there's different ways that we kind of add to these stories and build on who these characters are Juliana was brought on after we had kind of built um a lot of like the pitch and then a few kind of sample pages of the book and um she just had the same sort of energy as us. And uh, it, it was a lot of, you know, at first, I think we were all really like polite with each other and just like, oh, here you go. Wow, we love your art. And then like, we just realized that we were all the same kinds of people. And again, it just like devolves into like us in messenger, sending all caps lock messages and just being like, you're beautiful. Your art's beautiful. How are you so good? Like, wow, wow. And uh, I think we just, our collaboration style is a lot of really loving each other and supporting each other and um, reining it in only when we need to. <laughs> kind of bouncing off of that, like for Oh My Gods, how much of like each character was kind of designed by you or Insha mm. or Juliana? Yeah. So like the character designs themselves are 100% Juliana. Insha and I came up with like the characters together and who we wanted to feature in the book originally we had a much bigger cast and we were like oh we need to like pare this down like this is too many characters <laughs> writing an ensemble cast is hard especially with like only a small amount of pages because like 200 is pages in graphic novels mm -hmm. really isn't that much um so Incha and I built those characters together as mentioned she would go in and really like flesh them out and uh basically make them real people to us, I guess, in a way. Um, but yeah, I think we kind of like created those together, but Incha really got the voices. So whereas I definitely like, would we built the outline together and I would kind of script, but then Incha would go in and I would just have placeholder dialogue and she would go in and be like, Tina doesn't sound like this, Stephanie, you know, like so-and-so doesn't sound like this. Uh, this is what they would say. And because she had done such an extensive job in getting into their heads, uh, she was able to kind of go in and kind of make unique dialogue to each of them. Uh, Zed, however, is like a hundred percent my like brainchild. <laughs> I love him so much. Uh, and then Incha gave a lot of, um, guidance and reference for Juliana but like realistically we gave Juliana the scripts we gave her everything she needed and then we're was kind of like if you see these characters differently please like 
interpret them like how you would like to, you know, and she's um, in Brazil and she was like, can we make like Dita, like Afro Latina? Can we make Artemis and Paul like Latina? I was like, we were like, yes, have at it, please like go for it. And, you know, like that's kind of what like collaboration is. Like you want everybody to contribute to the story and to feel like it's theirs because it is. If you wanted to do something solo, you would write prose and even books aren't a solo effort. You know, there's editors, there's, you know, book designers, there's all these other people involved in it. And to have a good story be put out into the world, there's numerous hands in that cookie jar. And uh, comics is just very upfront about that. And you need to really learn if you want to play in that sandbox to um, make sure you're making it fun for everyone else too. Well, that sounds like a dream team. I, would, I describe our three planning for this podcast as a battleground between <laughs> each of us. Uh, it's really cool hearing that you had such a large hand in like Zed as well, though, because he was actually my favorite character. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. he's I, so fun. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed writing Zed, and like, yeah, and she would like look at them and be like, "Yeah, no notes, like." Right. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so that one was, he was so much fun to write. Um, speaking of Zed, um, who is actually Zeus um, in the book. Um, so this whole series is based on Greek mythology, obviously. Um, so there's obviously kind of like a trend in like the recent few years of like having a lot of like middle grade sort of Greek mythology stories. Right. Like, why do you think that is? Like, did it start with like Percy Jackson, maybe? I don't think necessarily. Like, I think yeah. kids, if you talk to any person who was once a young person, <laughs> many of them will tell you that Greek mythology was something that they were obsessed with. And when you kind of talk to young people, and even like in my own experience, I liked to read up because like, you want to be a grown up when you're a kid. You want to be taken seriously. You tell your parents, you're like, I'm not a kid anymore. And you're like nine. You're like, I'm not a baby. And so you read up. You want people to like see you as more grown. And not to say that I didn't enjoy age appropriate things, but Greek mythology was something that felt very grown up but still had really cool stuff in it. Like it was like, yeah, this is like for adults, but it's got like magic and like mythological creatures, gods and goddesses. And my parents like foisted Catholic school on me. They did not, they're not religious in any way, shape or form, but in Canada, it's like a better education system. So my parents were like, pew, pew, it's off to Catholic school with you. Have fun with that. We're not going to partake in this whatsoever. So paired with, the fact that like, I feel like people are gonna yell at me, but like as a kid, uh, the Bible seems very boring compared to (laughs) Greek mythology. So when you're like really kind of like discovering different like religions and history and all this stuff in the world, you're just like, damn, why can't I go to that school? Like, why can't I do study that? And so I really gravitated towards it. And I think that's kind of something that a lot of kids go through is, you know, playing around with like fun parts of history that are interesting and compelling. So I think there's been a lot of books and media in general that explore Greek mythology because there is always a connection to be found in young readers. They're deeply interested in those worlds. And uh, Percy Jackson definitely like ignited a flame in young people and just was like a really big mainstream thing that married Greek mythology with modern storytelling in a really excellent way and kind of re-highlighted to people that like Greek mythology is in fact cool this isn't just a nerd thing this is a cool thing or maybe it's just a cool nerd thing I don't know uh but I think you know there's always phases in publishing where certain things are in style so you always kind of see batches of stuff you know Mm -hmm. like fairy tales are really cool again all of a sudden there's like a batch of stuff and it's not intentional it's not like anyone's like hey 
should we all like go in on Greek mythology? It's just like this weird shift and publishers start acquiring similar projects. They're trying to fill a gap and they all kind of fill a gap at the same time. So you see these like waves, right? So Greek mythology will go out of style, air quotes style, mm -hmm. again, for a little bit where you won't see things coming out and then it'll resurface. But um I think it's something that kids tend to like love no matter what. It's like dinosaurs, like I'm wearing a dinosaur shirt. And like, as an adult, <laughs> I have an obscene amount of dinosaur clothes because dinosaurs are always cool. There's no kid in the universe that's ever like, oh, you know what's really lame? Dinosaurs. It's just <laughs> not a thing. So I, I feel like that's the same with Greek mythology. <laughs> well, I definitely relate to that. I'm actually a, a classics minor, um, and I started learning Latin in seventh grade, and so I was like oh. a total nerd about that stuff, and I still am. Yeah, so so yeah, you were you were talking about how you know we're kind of, I guess maybe like the last ten years or something like that um, is like a renaissance of like going back and looking at Greek mythology, and I think something that's really popular is like retellings of characters who you know people think they might have gotten wrong the first time or there's like a different perspective that you could tell and oh my god it's, it's focused on like a retelling of Medusa right um mm -hmm. and I think that that's also been really popular in the last few years because she's you know traditionally been like 100% evil terrifying monster and in this book she's not that right she's kind of she's like a scared right. kid um who just doesn't know how to handle this ability that she's been given and yeah, so I was wondering, like, why you decided to pick, like, Medusa and, like, portray her in this way. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, prefacing this with, Incha and I are both only children. So there are, is a certain degree of, like, loneliness that comes with being an only child. It's, like, not called lonely child for, you know, no reason. Like, that's a thing. So, like, I think struggling with those kind of feelings growing up and kind of not knowing where you fit in and kind of not knowing how to socialize with others at some times too is something that we were both really drawn to talking about and um with Medusa I just feel that Medusa's lore is deeply misunderstood mistranslated I don't know I, I, I'm going to take a slight aside and kind of mention there was a version of the Odyssey that was translated a few years ago and for the first time ever it was like translated by a woman and in doing that translation by a woman who interpreted certain words in a different way that's not just like by a bunch of like white dudes the story is completely changed you know it's a different story without dudes just being like yeah it's all about us like refocusing that with somebody who was more I think a little bit like unbiased and kind of opens up different story possibilities. And like you said, like there are always going to be a million different versions that you can interpret with that. And that's like obviously straight up translation of like something that was created a gajillion years ago. And we're mentioning kind of retellings. Uh, and then coming back to like the retellings thing, it's almost all of Greek mythology is extremely problematic. <laughs> all of it. <laughs> yeah. uh, there is like, I love it. Don't get me wrong. And I love drama that doesn't involve me. Uh, but writing that stuff for a middle grade audience, you need to change things. Uh, you can't just be like, well, they were all brothers and sisters. So it's historically <laughs> accurate. Like that doesn't fly. You need to interpret things and you need to change things and you need to retell things for those audiences. So it's like, how can you take the essence of these characters and infuse new life in them, make them modernized and also age appropriate. Um, and then coming back to Medusa uh, and tying that in all together here, uh, Medusa's lore even translated as is like I just have never understood why she's a villain like a really bad thing happened to her uh for no reason whatsoever she was minding her own business and she was assaulted and then because she was assaulted she was then punished to be a gorgon like I would be really mad too 
Like what? So I think there's like all these like stories involving Medusa that just like really do her dirty. Like she shouldn't be cast as like this villain. And like, if so, she has every right to be extremely angry. Um, and I really wanted to play, not just I, Insha and I wanted to play around with changing that up and kind of presenting Medusa in a different light, you know, like, it, I don't know, like, I just don't see her as this angry monster. I mean, there's definitely cause for that. Again, she's very deserving of anger, but like this monster, she wasn't that, like that was like inflicted upon her for something really traumatic and awful that happened. And I, I think it was important to kind of like see her in a different light and give her um, a rebirth in our storytelling. Yeah, I mean, we when when we read the first book in Percy Jackson for our podcast, right? Like Medusa is one of the the villains, and yeah, we, yeah. we had an extensive conversation about this. Um, <laughs> but oh, fun fact is that um, I actually took a class with that professor who translated the Odyssey, the first like uh, woman to translate the Odyssey. Yeah! Yeah, she is like, I don't know, maybe the most f- famous person. Pro- yeah, definitely the most famous person I've ever taken a class with. And she was super awesome. I deeply want to read that version of the Odyssey. Like, a lot of like classics are not specifically my jam. My eyes just glaze over in a lot of those cases. Not necessarily because of the quality. I just have ADHD and I have trouble with kind of focusing on big clumps of text like that. But I'm so interested in this version of it. I've heard amazing things about it, and that is deeply cool. Uh, that was a really great answer. <laughs> um, I was also thinking about that in terms of like Zeus as well, because you know Zeus is historically a very problematic, problematic yeah, person, <laughs> but he's just like a goofy dad. And oh my god, which is yeah. so endearing. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we see. It's hard sometimes writing middle grade stuff that you know adults will review uh and I don't seek out reviews very often or at all when I can help it and I can always help it because like that's just being mean to yourself if you do but every now and again you catch a glimpse of something and people are like like oh Medusa this like villain was so obvious and I'm like Gary you're 45 like (laughs) it wasn't meant for you and you know, people being like, oh, the Zed portrayal was like really unrealistic. And it's like, it's been a very long time since the Greek mythology times. Why is it not plausible that like maybe in one instance of Zeus's lifetimes, he tries to maybe not be a bad dad? You know, we've seen that story. We've seen him be a real terrible person in Greek mythology. And it just seems like, you know maybe I'll try something new maybe I will like I I don't see how like to me that's not implausible to kind of like explore and to see what that would look like um so yeah I don't know I really had fun like playing around with portraying him in a different light and he's still very like self-centered and he's still very like clueless and just doesn't really get how to be a good father but he's trying and um I don't know, like, I I had a lot of fun, like, doing that and kind of portraying it. You know, like, I played a game recently. Uh, by recently, I mean, I started it three years ago, forgot <laughs> about it, and then finished it recently. Um, but this game called Phoenix Rising, which is, like, a really specific intersection of everything I love, like Zelda and Greek mythology. And uh, they have Zeus and Prometheus as narrators. And Zeus is, like, a sweet, oblivious ding-dong. He's like, oh, like, you know, like as the mythology kind of unfolds in the game, he's like narrating, kind of doing like this commentary and being like, yeah, yeah, totally did that. Oh, what an ass. Oh, wait, sorry. Am I allowed to say bad words? Yeah, yeah, but anyways, good. you're good. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, <laughs> I feel like as a middle grade author, I say gosh and golly a lot. And then I <laughs> slip and I'm like, hmm, but I have not said that. Anyway, uh, but like, that was a really fun portrayal of him being really self-aware of like the bad things. And I don't know, like, I kind of feel like we did something similar in him, not like 
forgetting those bad things, but trying to kind of do right by somebody uh, for once? Uh, this is kind of a branching question, but um, sort of related to like, we were talking about Percy Jackson. I, I think I saw in the marketing at some point for Oh My God, so it was like, this is the new Percy Jackson and stuff like that. So um, I was wondering like with probably like a lot of younger people having preconceived notions about like modern retellings of Greek mythology being similar to Percy Jackson um, and with it maybe being an influence, like how, how did you go about like kind of differentiating your like world from that world? Yeah, I think naturally our world is very different because like Percy Jackson kind of like takes place in the world. Like it doesn't take place in Mount Olympus. I mean, that's probably changed because I know Rick Riordan has like 10,000 books now and Greek mythology and other mythology in general is just his playground, which I respect. That's awesome. Uh, but I think there's enough of like a difference in even just the setting and that sort of thing to kind of be its own thing. But because Percy Jackson is such a behemoth and it's the most recognizable thing for Greek mythology in kind of like modern storytelling, that it's impossible to not make those comparisons, right? Um, we had a really hard time actually finding a publisher uh, for Oh My Gods originally, because like we had a lot of interest. People are like, yeah, we're really into this. Yeah, this is cool. Love the characters, love this, wow great, but Percy Jackson exists. And it's like, okay, but like Percy Jackson's books, like we're graphic novels, it's different. Other people can play in these sandboxes too, but it was a really big struggle. Um, and that being said, you know, uh, I think realistically the only kind of similarities between us is kind of just like, yes, we're playing in those sandboxes together. Uh, and they're for younger audiences. Like ours is middle grade. I'd say Percy Jackson's definitely more like YA. They're modernized, I guess, too. Uh, and the Greek mythology is the biggest kind of connective tissue there. Um, but it's marketing people, they want to make sure you know what you're getting into. And Percy Jackson, again, is like the thing that is easily the most comparable, right? Uh, you wouldn't like compare it to, you know, like Circe or like Song of Achilles sort of thing. Like it's not that. So it's it's just the most natural thing to comp it to. I do think um, it does do a really good job of like being separate from Percy Jackson, like pretty obviously, like, you know, like there's only one demigod character, for instance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hmm. yeah, it's. I mean, it's hard to like dabble in like Greek mythology stuff and introduce like a kind of like air quotes, nobody character and not have them somehow get kind of involved in those worlds. So I guess that's also a good kind of comparison too. But we had actually also played with the idea of that person not being a demigod, like just actually a regular person, right? And you've probably seen like on Twitter when like the Olympics or social media in general, when like the Olympic is on and they're just like, okay, but like, what if one average person just competed just so we could get like <laughs> a comparison to how this all is. Yeah. And I think that was kind of like, in our minds, what we wanted to kind of do. We're like, what if just like an average person was involved with this? Like they weren't, you know, full of shenanigans and they didn't have other magical, mystical things going on. But we wound up going down that route and I'm, I'm happy we did. It's a fun thing to explore too. But um, I, I also just enjoy the idea of someone normal in the midst of supernatural stuff. Yeah, well, speaking of that, what we were talking about before this podcast was, you know, Karen is a demigod, but in the first book, it's not clear what her power is. Right. Um, so, I mean, is that something that's revealed in the second book? It is. Okay. So we definitely laid some groundwork in the first one. Uh, so that when you read the second one, you're like, oh, and you can kind of see little bits of like Easter eggs that lead to that. Uh, and we definitely did our best to have like breadcrumbs throughout. Uh, but it is explored pretty extensively in the second one. In the second one, um, the, the, the group of friends start up the school newspaper again. 
And basically Karen's like a big gamer too. That's like her way to connect with her friends back home. She plays online games and, you know, that's like a normal thing to do for kiddos. And um, somebody starts kind of like wrecking their games, like crashing them and just kind of like trolling them. And subsequently with this happening, they find a maze uh, that is in the basement of their school, like you do. And of course, investigate it also like you do. (laughs) Um, And the person um, has set up the maze to kind of replicate the game that Karen plays with her friends. Uh, And kind of through that, we explore some of the powers of the gods and goddesses that she's become really good friends with, as well as um, the powers manifesting in Karen. Yeah, yeah. And then Jeff, who really likes pancakes. Uh, (laughs) What I have learned in writing for young people is the one character who's on a page in the corner and just says one thing is the character that they will want everything to be about. (laughs) More Jeff content, please. (laughs) Yes. And uh, he is very much in the second one. And um, yeah, yeah. There's a very young kid who was sweet named Wesley who was wanted me to know that that was like the best thing ever like Wesley was like oh I'm excited for this he just really (laughs) likes pancakes and I relate to that I do too so now we're just gonna do a lightning round of some like fun trivia that we can learn about oh my gods and Stephanie Cook so um yeah first question how did you come up with the title (laughs) I mean uh, we're just I I like puns I like bad jokes and like you can't just have people say oh my god all the time and love Greek mythology and not be like oh this works (laughs) although again in we do not seek out reviews but occasionally they stumble into your path. And I do remember this woman because there is like a few other things that are also called, oh my gods. I acknowledge it It makes sense. I understand why other people have connected those dots too. But this review was like, we get it. Oh my gods, Greek mythology, please. Can we put like a permanent stop on naming books this? And I was like, okay, like there weren't a ton of books. Like there were no books when we created this idea that had that title. So it seemed like a good idea at the time. Ah, anyways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was a cute title. Yeah. So. Thank you. <laughs> I enjoy it too. Yeah. <laughs> Did you, are there any particular like graphic novels that inspire you? Yeah. Like constantly, like a million things. Uh, Raina Telgemeier is, a huge inspiration. Um, Raina has this way of telling stories that are so relatable for kids. And even though they're just kind of like these things that she's deeply connected to, there's these themes within them that even if it's like something like Smile is her first graphic novel and it's about dental surgery and basically this horror story of getting her teeth fixed, which like sounds horrifically boring just kind of like talking about that and what it's about but you get into the book and there's all of these feelings and you know it explores all of these things that kids universally go through and can just be like oh my gosh yeah I I didn't fit in because of this thing that I was going through or like I had like headgear as a kid or like and all of her books have that and this effortless ability to not only create a story around these relatable slice of life adventures of a kid, but they managed to put things like her book Guts is like about anxiety and kind of having these horrible feelings that like as a kid, you don't know how to kind of put to word. You're just like, my tummy hurts. I don't understand why I feel weird and apprehensive. And like, that's not even a word that you necessarily have as a kid. And I just have the utmost respect for somebody who can not only make these things relatable and understandable and digestible to kids, but to the point where like they actively want to seek out these everyday stories and devour them. Like just incredible. I, I I like bad jokes too much to like ever be at that level, but like, 
I am forever floored by Reina and everything she does. Who's your favorite Greek god? Hmm, Artemis. Um, <laughs> I I have a tattoo of Artemis like all on my arm, but like I think in an interview once, and this like ages me, I guess, a bit too. I was like, she's like the sporty spice of Greek mythology. And I was like, I can't believe this is like in a library, like a fancy literary literary magazine. Like I've given the dumbest quote imaginable, but that's kind of like, uh, I just think she's like deeply cool. And I love her. <laughs> can tell that in the writing of her. And oh my God, she's definitely the jock character. <laughs> yeah, she's I just, really cool. oh, I, I really... I think that was like both of us. Like it was like, you know, what would she do if she was in school and kind of trying to imagine what each of their roles would kind of be as kids, as opposed to the adults we see in Greek mythology. And it just felt like a really natural fit. So we have a question that's pretty similar, but did you have a favorite character like specifically to write? Um, um, I guess it was probably Zed. I don't know. Or, or <laughs> Hunter really said you- was a character you relate to it's most. probably also zeb uh, okay. although Incha <laughs> would tell you Incha like we did like an interview together once and she was just like kind of just like imagined karen as like a young step and i was like mm. did you so like that's weird like i didn't write myself into the book but like my co-writer kind of did but like uh so i guess in theory technically but uh i feel like zed was just a lot of fun also like in canada uh like the letter z is pronounced Mm. z here so like it was like if you're short forming zeus to just the letter it really tickled me also to name him like the canadian version of z (laughs) uh and everyone's just like yeah like why z and i'm like because it makes me happy i definitely also and this is also maybe cheating as well but like Artemis, I was very sporty as like a young person too. Maybe not quite as like aggressive uh, of like others as Artemis is, but um, I relate to that life. <laughs> so Stephanie, thank you so much for coming to talk with us. This was really amazing. Um, we loved you. your book. And yeah, it was great to hear more from the behind the scenes. Oh, thank you so much. I, as you can tell thoroughly enjoyed talking so uh (laughs) it's great to be here like we said at the beginning oh my gods to the forgotten maze it just came out but everyone should go out and read it and also our next episode will still feature stephanie as our special guest but we're going to be reading her favorite book from her childhood the golden compass um by (laughs) philip pullman (laughs) (laughs) had to check on just double check yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Was like, but i'm excited see you guys next time bye bye, bye. okay cool <laughs> and see <laughs> <laughs>